ultra triggering things, commitment and finances. When you are, yeah, this is, this is really, really big stuff. Commitment and finances, commitment in and of itself can be a really scary thing. And yet in relationship and the love world, this is the gold that we want. We start out going, all right, I want a commitment. I want a relationship. Do you want the same thing as me? We're trying to find out if we vibe. We try to find out if we're on the same page. We're trying to figure out if we can make a good team together while not sacrificing any of the good feelings. And this is, really, really interesting territory. I, and another reason why I love being part of what we do, part of Siren School is this, and maybe you can describe this, what it, what it's like for you. But for me, it's like this place where it's like, no matter what the challenge is, we can, we can figure it out. That love place of whatever we're going through, whatever the challenge is, we can make it through because there's love. Like in and so, on some days it feels more like a fairy tale and other days it feels more real. And we kind of coming in and out of the loop of that place. A scenario that came up, commitment and finances. When you're moving into more serious relationships and you know that he's got a past, he's got children from a different relationship, he's got an ex-wife and he has, he these people are going to be part of his life forever. That is not, often enough, it's not going to feel really, really great. It may not even feel fair. There may be a lot of triggering feelings that come up here. So how do we navigate this space? If we're choosing this man, or if we're not in a place where we can not choose this man, if that makes sense, still in that, in that space, what can we do? What can we do as we're, as we're navigating this space where we're, we're, we're triggered, we don't feel good. We're not sure that it feels fair. Where, where can we go from here? All right. Well, I'm just going to step into the space here. I sound a little funny. I haven't had a voice in a week and I'm not, I don't have my voice as the tool of resonance that I've always relied on it for. But so much has become clear for me. And the clarity is, again, all in feminine energy in how much we try to do, how much we compensate. And here's a big word. Let's add this to the loops, compensation. We compensate for what we think of as some weakness. And then we overdo on the other hand. So we are over-functioning, which is our training to overfunctioning with men to overfunction at work to overfunction with our kids and it's not a real loving giving place over functioning it's not a natural radiance of affection and love and and warmth and generosity and gratitude it is a desire to control the over functioning is if i do this then he will do that if I do this, then he will owe me that. If I do this, I will be a good mother. It's all for masculine strategic reasons. And it is so natural to us from the day we're born that we're taught to be civilized and behave and be good boys and girls because then we get to survive, literally. We get to survive and we get to do better. We get better food. We get better looks from our parents. We get better looks from the guys. It's all just in this insidious programming. We might as well just be computers programmed by our situations. So if that is true and you're willing to go, you know, I'm in here somewhere. I'm a soul of me. Yet my words, my behavior, the sounds I make, the feelings that I choose to entertain, which you'll learn at the master class what that actually means. The feelings that I choose to entertain and, and allow the thoughts around to monopolize my brain and, and choose the direction that my thoughts continue to go in. All of those things have to do with overcompensating for weakness, overfunctioning because something scares you. In other words, I felt scared that without being able to speak, 
I wouldn't be able to any number of things. I wouldn't be able to control my life. I wouldn't be able to be happy. I wouldn't be able to communicate what I need. I wouldn't be able to be in charge of anything. I wouldn't be able to do videos. It became a thing. Well, it's like, you know, when you, you broke your leg, you know, it's like, oh, I can't walk. I can't do it. You know, all of these inabilities come up for you and they frighten us understandably because everything that we have used to get by and get as far as we've gotten and hang on to what we've got and get what we've got all of a sudden seems like without it we lose well what happens is if you allow this to happen and there's so many ways to get sick now with colds and blues and God, goodness knows these days and most of us accept you know a few days a week of illness even after covid and you know, we were asked to watch TV, but, you know, but a lot of people uh, suffer from all kinds of all the time feelings of mental blues and depression and tiredness and hormonal issues. Most of us women have things like that that make us feel not our best. So we're automatically afraid on top of all the other stuff. So we're overcompensating, right? So this overcompensation if you just for one moment go, ah, and I just stop talking and I stopped wanting to talk and my husband would speak to me and normally I would want to speak loud enough to carry to him wherever he is in the house or walk into his space or whatever. So my husband's like a cat. Hi. And then he tiptoes away. <laughs> That's my husband. He's, he's so kitty cat. And I think I am too. He's a masculine kitty cat, you know, hey, I'm talking to you right now, but I'm going to disappear. And I'm like that too. And we have learned together to stay, what? Stare at each other, let the conversation continue, let it go forward. But that's another thing. That's our, our group, our sanctuary relationship. But he would just kind of not be in a place I could vocalize to him. And the second I went, stop, feel it in your body. Go, go, stop. What you're trying to do, what you want to do to overcompensate, to, to puppeteer, to control, whatever it is, it's a feeling that wells up into you as this, I'm going to jump the goal. I'm going to go get dressed and get out. I'm going to do this. And if you just don't and you just slide back and you do nothing, all of a sudden this energy pours back into you. It may not be the physical energy, but it's an emotional, peaceful, spiritual energy will pour right back into you. And all of a sudden you feel uncompromised. You don't feel like you're, you're over-functioning. You don't feel like you, it's amazing. It's all of a sudden you feel, oh, and then the husband walks back into the room. I realize he couldn't talk to me. All of a sudden it becomes a magnet again. So this was an incredible practice for me. So where are you when somebody says, jump, where are you saying how high? Where are you when they ask you a question, where are you answering? Instead of saying a faith message, instead of going inside, finding out who you are and what your stillness is. And I guess this word stillness is something that we should really explore. It's where you stop all the noise in your own self and you fall in, you stop it for a moment so you can see it and feel it it doesn't mean you disappear it you just stop the momentum of it you just go whoa no more and then you can feel the sparkles you can feel all the stuff going on and it's like oh i don't have to do anything and then you carry that into the rest of your relationship so to carry that into the question of finances and then i'll let naomi have a shot at this uh, money is a big deal. Money is a big, big, big deal. Almost all relationships. If you do not, if you are a woman who has a career and makes money and you do not need anybody else's money, then marry and have a relationship with everybody regardless of money. Construction guys, artists, doesn't matter. However, emotionally, you're still going to be that old-fashioned girl and go, he's not bringing in money. However, my guess is 
that everybody is like this, but they don't realize it, which is, it's not the money. It's some version of the effort they're putting out. Some version of the effort. Because as soon as a guy starts to build a business or to um, show up at networking groups or to go look at jobs or whatever the heck he's, he's doing that matches your effort in the work world, that matches you so that you can talk about things that interest you so that he's not a retired person while you're a working person. So that he doesn't feel in a different place than you, then everything becomes wonderful again. But that's very rare. Usually it's like we got him in a place. He's there. I'm here. We are so far apart. I no longer respect him. And once you start to feel that feeling of lack of respect, it's gone for you. I'm just, I'm just going to tell you, it's gone. If you don't feel respect for him because... He's not putting out the effort that you are putting out for the relationship's well-being. You're going to start not respecting him. You're starting to look around other guys. So don't marry a guy like that is my flat-out advice. Unless you've got all the money in the world and you don't care. And you really can talk to a coach about how to really not care. Not just say you don't care. But that he doesn't effort. I have many friends who are married to men who bring in no money whatsoever, but they supply so much other stuff. They supply, um, they make parties for you. They they call all your friends for you. They take care of you. To, they make baths for you and put you in the bath. They do all these loving things as part of their nature. I have many friends with men like that. They take you out for fun. They're super fun guys. They're the, they're the epitome, the bad guy, you know, the the, the tough guy, the, all the guys we're so attracted to, the ne'er-do-well guys, but you don't need their money, so it works out beautifully, and then they put out all this effort towards you, but if a guy's putting out no effort towards you, he's not putting in the bath, he's not listening to you, he's not walking around and being where you are, he's not asking you what you need and making your tea, he's not doing any of that shit, you are going to be unhappy. So if you're seeing that now, don't marry him. Keep dating him. Keep circular dating. See what happens. But you want to keep your eye on your, your feelings. And you cannot, you can choose what feelings to entertain. Like the I love you feelings because you're so cute to look at. And you're really good with my kids. And uh, you make a mean dinner. All those things are valuable to you. But if you don't feel that effort coming at you and that energy, you are going to disrespect him. You're going to hate him. You are going to shut down around him. And there's nothing we can do to fix that that will make sense to you. Although I will have you entertain those things he does do. And it may pull you out of it. But, if, you know, if you're starting from, should I keep on with this guy? No, don't. Right off, you got a problem. So that is my opinion. Naomi, what you got? You know, it's something where you're talking about you wouldn't respect him. And there's there's, there's like the, the clue is inside of us there. But for me, it's like a turn on and a turn off. What turns me on to a guy and what turns me off a guy? And what is the picture in my head of what I think a masculine guy should be doing? Or what is it that I'm thinking that is um, that the man should be the provider of the family? And that's, you know, that's what it is. Or or how is it the picture in my head is is making me want something but as it actually does it turn me on or does it turn me off and like the question we had from a lady whose whose um, fiance is, has a child and sort of maintenance to pay from a previous marriage and you know she's worried about that I'm worried about how that works out and you know to quote Jeffrey Levine he says everything is talk aboutable and when and there is so much as we're building a relationship and as we are exploring another human being and getting to know another human being, whether it's from two weeks or 20 years, there, there can be a conscious period of negotiation and creating the contract going forward. 
Now that can seem really cold and dry, but the intimacy that it creates and the clarity can be such a turn on also. That clarity of being able to express yourself, what makes me feel good. And I've been doing this with my partner. We've been talking about time. We're we're not at the money bit yet, but we're at the time bit. You know, what's the time that I want to spend as Naomi just doing my thing with my friends, my people without him? And what are the things he wants to do? What are the things that we want to do as a couple? How do I see our we time? How does he see our we time? And what a turn on it is hearing your partner talk about the time, their we time. And then what about us as a couple? How do we want to move forward with our time? And I would just urge anyone who is in the situation this lady is in is to come with curiosity because, you know, addressing you directly, this lady, you're marrying a man who is stepping up for his family. He steps up. He has not just abandoned that child and his ex-wife. Whatever happened in that relationship happened, but he's stepping up. Now, to me, that's really masculine and really honorable. He's not giving 90% of his income. He's giving a percentage. So anything after that is for the two of you to talk about. What do you both bring to the relationship financially? What happens if he loses his job. How does he cover her maintenance? Would he expect her to cover it? And do you know what? All these conversations, they can make us breathe out. They can get us back from our heads of going, because I'm guessing this lady is going to be so much up there going, What's, what, are we, what if this, what if that? But what if he's got a solution for that already? What if he's thought about that? And, and having these kind of curiosity conversations can bring you from your head down into your body. It brings that feeling of safety or you actually get to see you're not on the same page. Better now than in five years time, 10 years time when you're married. And But you really get to see that. And, and I would urge anyone to have these kind of conversations about time, about money, about sex, about where you live, about these things getting curious as to how it is for the other person and getting curious how it is for you, what feels good for you, what doesn't feel good, and just exploring that. Because the feeling when you hear your partner expressing how they see things, there's a feeling like for me, it's just like a feeling of safety just ran through me. It was like, oh, wow. I could just go off in loops in my head about what I supposed it might be, but I'm really hearing. And I, and then you start hearing commitment. You start hearing. So that's where it is for me is, is can we look and see what his actions are telling us and the actions. And, and, you know, my partner, he has, a, he has other children from another marriage. Immediately. I just see this honorable man this honorable man who is fulfilling on a commitment to his family there, but it doesn't take away from his commitment to me and his love for me. So that's, that's just totally my take on that one. Oh. Is to dive in with curiosity. Rory. Yeah. That is so beautiful. What a beautiful story. I'm so thrilled for you now. And the fact that you could have this conversation with him and that he is honorable and that is an honorable thing to take care of your child and your previous family. And I just want to throw this thing in here. Um, things happen that you can't plan for. Mm -hmm. And we are different today than we were in my mother's generation. We can be financially autonomous and that's a really important thing and yet a lot of women do marry to not be autonomous a lot of women do marry to be supported and provided for so that they can be the artsy craftsy not have to make any money person although that is rarer and rarer and rarer these days even the wives of big time celebrities that i see on tv have their own passions and their own work that they like to do. They they don't want to sit still. So 
if you have your own thing in you, if you have your own passion, it doesn't matter what he brings in financially. All you need to know is, as Naomi say, know how you feel about what's going on for him. In other words, uh, such an honorable thing of taking care of your family is a very different thing than just being a lay around, right? Or just not having ambition. It's a very different feeling for you. And so I want to tell my story, my mother's story. My mother married my father who graduated from the preeminent law university there was. He was a lawyer for Northwestern and Hanson. And that's what my mother thought. She was an artist and she had been working actually in department stores doing drawings, art drawings. They would use photographs. They would use drawings of dresses and women. And she knew what it was to be working. She was also an actress and a singer. She'd been to California and she went back to New York. And here she thought she was marrying a lawyer. I was going to take her away so she could have a family, which is what she wanted. All she wanted was to be a mom. And then they moved to California and bingo, my father no longer wanted to be an attorney. So he became a door-to-door -door pot and pan salesman. Well, you can imagine what my mother might have gone through. And then he became an insurance salesman. And then that job went when my, my mother was maybe in her 50s, 55, and she realized she had to go to work. She had to go to work. She'd never been to work before and she had to work for the county. And my mother's a brilliant, artistic, talented, beautiful woman. And she ended up taking a very journeyman type job, but she liked talking with people and stuff. It wasn't what she had planned in her life. However, my father was happy. He was doing exactly what he wanted. He didn't want to be a lawyer. He liked talking with people door to door. He didn't care if he made enough money, but they didn't have enough money for us all to live, just fine. But I don't think my mother ever, ever got back to turned on to my father the way you were talking about Naomi. Ever. She was turned on to the power, not, not turned on to the man. And I have a feeling that in different variations, we all do that kind of thing. What is it that turns us on to this man in the first place? Is it a sense of confidence? Is it a sense of this? Or that? What is it? Is it something about him? Or is it the way he treats you and the way you feel when you're with him? Because that will stay. Because my mm -hmm. father always gave my mother that. But that was never what she really wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, on a deep level, she never, she was never a person who really wanted that connection. She wanted the kids. She wanted safety, financially. She wanted different things. So what I want you to do is find out what it is you want. If money is so important to you and worrying about the money is so important to you, then respect that in yourself. If what you want is the connection and to feel loved and to feel loved by a good man, who you already know is good because he's taking care of his family, that should wash through you and you'll feel it. And then you'll know where your stability is and where your turn on is. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the problem is we just never know what we want. So I hope to see you at the class on next Sunday where we figure out what it is you want and how to go in that direction in every conversation with a man, rather than in the direction that somebody else put together in your mind, mm -hmm. somebody else put into your program. So big, so big that Sunday, it's coming up on Sunday for everyone. If we need to get you links to make sure that you don't miss that, then we'll do that. The Want Masterclass this Sunday with Rory, where we're going to do power tools around being with what you want. We're actually going to do a whole new, shiny, brand new process called the Feminine Want Process. It's six steps. It's a whole shortcut to the entire modern siren methodology. It's going to be a, what do I do when I'm feeling this? I'm standing in front of him. And a whole new way to, it's a shortcut. Shortcut to the modern okay. siren process. Very exciting. Wow. It's very exciting. And you all know it possibly as based in riffing but it's going to be more simple than that. I'm really excited because I'm going to wait, be winging it. So show up so that we can all wing it together. Thank you. Thank you, Rory, for everything today. Thank you, Naomi, for being here with us. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.